Well, greetings from Cooperstown, New York. We're very glad that you could join us on a summer night in Tuesday, uh, on a Tuesday for the virtual author series, uh, broadcasting from Cooperstown just outside of the Baseball Hall of Fame. And we're very glad to have with us as part of our virtual author series, Lewis Moore, uh, who has written a, a couple of books, one of which is certainly pertinent uh, to our topic of baseball and very much fits in with the Hall of Fame's new Black Baseball Initiative. We recently announced the name of a new exhibit, Souls of the Game, about Black baseball and Black baseball history. It's going to be opening in under a year from now, in the spring of 2023. Uh, and we're glad to have a chance to talk about some of these related topics with our guest, Lewis Moore. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Bruce Marcus, and I work in the Hall of Fame's uh, Education Department. And uh, glad to introduce our guest tonight. He is the author of We Will Win the Day, The Civil Rights Movement, The Black Athlete, and The Quest for Equality. Uh, prior to that, wrote uh, another book, I Fight for a Living, Boxing in the Battle for Black Manhood from 1880 to 1915. Uh, has also narrated a terrific series for the great courses called A Pastime of Their Own, The Story of Negro League Baseball. And he's currently a professor of history at Grand Valley State in Allendale, Michigan. Very glad to have with us uh, Lewis Moore. Lewis, thanks for being with us on this Tuesday summer evening. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So your school year must have ended, uh, what, more than a month ago. Uh, what, what do you work on during the summer? Ah, watching my kids play basketball. And uh, <laughs> when I have time. I'm finishing up editing a book on black quarterbacks. So um, that's it. So I get up, do my work, and then play with my kids. Nice. How many children do you have? Uh, three. So two going into sixth grade and one going, going to be a sophomore. Very good. So it's busy time for you, even though you're not necessarily in class on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, your book and how people can actually purchase it. Uh, it is called We Will Win the Day, the Civil Rights Movement, the Black Athlete, and the Quest for Equality. Uh, you can find it at Amazon.com, also at the University Press of Kentucky, their website, and that is KentuckyPress.com, KentuckyPress.com. Also, you have a website of your own. It is Prof. Lou Moore. Dot com, P R O F L O U M O O R E dot com. And the book can be obtained there as well. Uh, the book came out in uh, 2020. Uh, how has it been doing for you now that it's been out three years? I know it came out during the pandemic, but three years later, uh, how do you assess where you're at with it? No, it's, it's been doing well. It actually uh, was on hardback and uh, 2017 and then Kentucky bought the rights for the paperback so it's been uh doing well both times um it's in the classroom um that's one of the reasons why we got it on paperback so you know colleges can put it in their classroom um and it's just you know it's very like I said it's very timely right it's just Absolutely. a lot of the stuff that we continue to talk about in the book um just as as history so um, people, I, I think people like it. No one's actually told me it's bad. Uh, I don't know if <laughs> anyone would ever do that. Uh, so that's always good. Well, it's certainly gotten great reviews at Amazon.com. So I don't think anybody's going to tell you it's bad. It's uh, it's it's really re been received very positively over the last few years. Before we get into some of the specific topics uh, in your book, we will win the day. I want to kind of lay some background. One of the things we do at the Hall of Fame, we have a civil rights unit which is actually our most requested unit, third graders all the way up through high school and occasionally even colleges will request the program. Uh, we talk a lot uh, in the program about Jim Crow segregation. And this is one of the photos that we present. Uh, this is the classic example of the segregated restaurant, the uh, famous photo, Farmer's Cafe Quick Lunch, the white entrance to the restaurant on the left side, uh, the colored, or as we would say in today's vernacular, the Black or African American entrance on the right side of the restaurant. Uh, it's a classic photo. Many people, uh, probably most people in our audience have seen it before, but it certainly does illustrate uh, the kinds of Jim Crow segregation that we saw in this country 
dating back to the 1870s, really continuing well into the 20th century in parts of the country. Uh, and it was something that affected ball players as well. Even though many players, star players or celebrities, they were subjected to this kind of segregation if they were black. There really were uh, few, if any, exceptions made for them. Uh, another classic photograph is the water fountain, the white water fountain on the right, the black water fountain on the right. Uh, we, uh, we would see um, 1896, the Plessy versus Ferguson decision in which the Supreme Court uh, came down with a ruling that uh, this was separate but equal, that yes, we are separating black and white people in American culture in many different ways. Uh, but their contention, the court's contention, the contention of others was that, uh, well, everybody's still being treated the same. Everybody has equal access. We always show this photo to the kids when we talk about Plessy versus Ferguson. We ask the kids, do these water fountains look equal? Do they look alike? Obviously, they do not. So the whole idea of separate but equal really a fallacy, a false argument. But I think that's an important point, Lewis, to make right off the bat that uh, the segregation uh, that we saw in America affected athletes just like everybody else. And as we're going to see later in the program, segregation continued to persist in many areas, even after Jackie Robinson's historic arrival with the Dodgers in 1947. Yeah, no, it's you're exactly right, and this is uh, something that they all all these players unfortunately had to go through. Uh, all the black players and and the Afro Latino players had to go through right just to just to make it right or just to play America's game right even before Jackie comes into the big leagues and then like you said even after right and I'm sure we'll talk about it but to me it's just remarkable if you look at a team like I'm from Michigan or I live in Michigan not from Michigan but a team like the Tigers they don't. They don't integrate their spring training facilities until 1963, right? So that's what Jackie signs in 45. That's 18 years later until all, you know, Tigers and other teams finally in Florida. Um, but it also shows you something like that shows you the power of baseball, right? Because it's before the Civil Rights Act is passed, a whole year before, finally, like these teams realize like, oh, yeah, we could do this, right? We can make these cities change their laws and accommodate to us. We should mention that your book runs a span of years from 1945 to 1968. And 45, as you mentioned, really, that's the jumping off point. It is the initial signing of Jackie Robinson. He didn't sign with the Dodgers in 47. He was promoted to the roster, the Brooklyn roster, at the end of spring training. But he actually signs in 1945 after having played part of a season for the Kansas City Monarchs in the Negro Leagues. So this really begins the jumping off point to the story of integration or reintegration in the major leagues. Robinson signing with the Brooklyn organization, he goes to the minor leagues in 46, and then promoted to the major leagues in 47. I'm curious, Lewis, what did you learn about Jackie Robinson going into this project? What, what were you able to pick up? I mean, we think we know a lot about Jackie Robinson, but when you started doing what was exhaustive research for the book, what were the kinds of things you picked up that you learned about him that you really had not been aware of? Yeah, so that's an excellent question. Um, a lot of it was just, I think one of it, I would say one of the things I learned is just how much he was, he was loved uh, by the Black community and just how much his presence in the major leagues had a grip on the black community. And so part of what I do in that book is I get newspapers from all over, you know, California, Detroit, Baltimore, New Orleans, all, all these places, um, just to New York, right? Just to look at their reactions to some of these events. And so looking at how they reacted to Jackie when he signed, when he's playing the minor leagues, when he comes up, like you said, with the Dodgers, and then every spring training, every game, just how it had this kind of grip on the community. To me, that, that was fascinating. Another fascinating part about him is just how, you know, if, if I'm sure the listeners know that when Branch Rickey 
quote unquote gives him his you know his his ability to speak right jackie's kind of silent on these racial issues and then once he gets it he just takes off right and he's calling everybody out he's calling teams like the yankees out he's going after southern states he's going after presidents and just how he's really consistent until the day he dies really right um up even that last World Series when he's calling out Major League Baseball in 1972. It's just years of consistency of trying to make America a better place. And to me, that's always fascinating when you're doing research, you're, you're you know, in the newspapers, you're reading a magazine, and here comes another Jackie issue, right? Here he is in South Carolina, here he is in Miami, um, just how he fought to make this country a better place. Well, let's give a sense of the general reaction that you saw in the newspapers. I would imagine the black press of the day, which is a very significant part of the coverage, reacted to this pretty favorably. What about the mainstream or the, the white media, if we can call it that, in the 1940s? Were they a little bit more lukewarm on this subject or did they also match some of that enthusiasm? Yeah, I, you know, I would say it's, it's they, in general, right, like if we're talking white media outside of the South, right, but, but in general, white media, or we saw, call it the daily press versus the black media, and most of those are weekly newspapers, they were excited, but they're excited for different reasons, right, if you're black in America, you're looking at Jackie as that, that one representation, you had Joe Lewis, who's a heavyweight boxer from, he's the champ from 30, 1937 to 1949, but now this is America's game, and this is a team game, and what you start to pick up is that sense, like, wait a minute, they're rooting for Jackie Robinson, and if they can root for Jackie Robinson, and if Brooklyn can hire Jackie Robinson, then I can get a job, then I can climb up, and you'll start to see a lot of reflections like that, like, okay, this place will be better for me, right, because you got to remember, if you're Black in America, you just came out of World War II and you fought in segregated military, right? But you also fought for what they call the double V. That's victory abroad. We're going to help the United States win the war and victory at home, right? We're going to end racism and Jim Crow at home. And Jackie becomes the symbol of that for so many people. Now, the white mainstream press, these daily newspapers, they, for the most part, loved it too because of what it meant. Right. And it goes back again to World War II. You can't fight this war for democracy and not have it at your house. Right. So so part of seeing Jackie Robinson's success is a way to like congratulate, self-congratulate America that we've done it. Democracy is here and things will start rolling along. Right. Because, again, a lot of a lot of people lost their lives. Right. In the name of democracy. And it looks really bad when you come home in segregation. And so whether it's Jackie Robinson or as I talk about in another chapter, Levi Jackson, who's a running back for Yale and becomes the captain, these moments of integration are really huge in this post-World War II America because it really shows how great America can be when everybody is go going to be given an equal opportunity. Was anyone in the mainstream media hostile toward the idea? They come out flat out and say, no, this is not a good idea. I think people were worried baseball wise, right? Um, not necessarily people getting together black and black and white, but can he actually do it? Is this kind of a stunt? Uh, because you got to remember outside of these individual athletes like uh, Joe Lewis and then Jesse Owens in 1936, they hadn't really seen a lot of black athletes really match up against white athletes. Remember, the, the, they hadn't had an Olympics since 1936, right? And all you're really getting is Joe Lewis and some lower level, they're great boxers, but can the, the white, can the black athlete compete with the white athlete? Is the Negro Leagues actually good? Now, if you're a real baseball fan, you probably understood that these guys could play, but those average people, right? And, and, and I think we kind of have the same type of media today where you always constantly question things because it, it gets readers. I think those average people were worried, could he, could he actually play? Is this a publicity stunt? I think that's where there was kind of some backlash. Lewis, what were the best of the Black newspapers that you were able to get access to in researching the book? Um, so, you know, it just depends of, of what time period I was researching. Uh, but, but you know, obviously the Pittsburgh Courier is really good. Uh, Chicago Defender, New York Amsterdam News. Um, my favorite one for this time, if we're talking like mid, late 40s, 
um, was was a black labor newspaper. It's escaping me right now. I have it all on PDF. Uh, there's a black labor newspaper in New York. I'll have to pull it up at, at some point. Uh, but it was it's it was my favorite because it's looking at all these issues from a labor question too. Um, but but those are really good. And then the Baltimore, if you're doing this time period, you have to have the Baltimore Afro-American because they have a writer, Sam Lacey, who's just excellent on all things uh, Black athletes, but especially, especially baseball. Yeah. Yeah, he's one of the recipients of our uh, Career Excellence for Writing Award. Um, uh, came back, uh, came to the Hall of Fame for the, uh, the ceremony in which uh, he was honored uh, one of my first years working in Cooperstown at the Hall of Fame. Let's talk a little bit about magazines. I was watching another interview that you did, and you talked about a magazine that sprang up in the 1970s. And it didn't last that long, but it was really quite good, Black Sports Magazine. Yeah, no, I it's it's uh I love it. The only way I've been able to get it is via uh eBay or I'll have my library get me a couple articles that I that I find. Um they if you're buying on my eBay, they can get pretty pricey, but it's it was a, a black sport. Like it's, it is what it says. It's, it's a magazine and, and Bryant Gumbel, you know, the Bryant Gumbel was one of the early editors. It's mm. very, very good um, look into black athletes at college, at the pro level, uh, really good, sharp writing, really great interviews. And I think when you read those interviews versus say a sport or a sports illustrated, these athletes, these black athletes are really more open uh because it's like oh this other black guy's interviewing me and i could be open with him i could talk about certain things whereas maybe they're a little bit more cautious with sports and sports illustrated so if anybody's doing research on the 1970s i highly recommend trying to get copies of of black sports um even if it doesn't maybe have the person you're looking for just to just to browse through and see how the black media is covering black athletes in the 1970s because it's, it's different right because by that time integration has started to take over and so the even the black newspapers the amount that they're allowed to write is changing right because once the integration comes a lot of people maybe you're not reading the defender as much as you're going to read maybe the tribune or the chicago sun so those publications change a little bit uh but black sports during the 1970s very very excellent in their their long form pieces and and their interviews I wanted to mention that at the Baseball Hall of Fame in our Giamatti Research Center, we have individual files, biographical files on anybody who played in the major leagues, most of the Negro Leagues players, significant baseball executives, things like that. And in some of the files pertaining to players from the early 70s, uh, we do have some of the articles clipped from Black Sports Magazine. I've used them in some of my own research. Uh, I've done some stuff on the 1971 Pirates and they're all black lineup. Uh, things like that are covered very nicely, in-depth interviews that they did with some of the black athletes of the day. So it is a tremendous resource and you can find it in the files uh, at the Hall of Fame library. Yeah. Just something no, for you to keep in mind. Uh, for the no, I say, I, yeah, I'll be there one day. Um, but I'll just say on that, on that black sports, right? They have, you know, for the readers out there or the listeners out there, they have an excellent piece on Mandy Seguin and, and Willie Stargell. And I think like, like I said, if you read those versus like other things, you, you'll start to get a, just a different um, take uh, on those two two great players and also the, the, that pirate team uh, and what it meant and and also at the same time I know we're getting off tangent here but I, I'm sure you found as a researcher doing it those Pittsburgh if I'm correct those Pittsburgh papers are on strike at the same time uh, that yes. the whole all those nine black players play uh, and so you don't really get it's it's so infuriating because you don't get that local take um, it's it, to me, it's one of those oh, one of those research days that you wish you had there. Uh, I believe the press and the Gazette are are both on strike, so you don't even get that local take. So, yeah, the only coverage I saw in those files was from Sports Illustrated and the Sporting News, national magazines, and that was several days after the fact because those are only weeklies and not dailies. But you're right, uh, the poor timing of that newspaper strike really right. prevented more in depth coverage of the all black lineup. I think it's one of the reasons why that event didn't get a lot of publicity initially and, and even in those first few years. Thankfully, uh, it's starting to get more publicity just a couple of years ago was the 50th anniversary of that all black lineup. 
Before we move on to other topics, I do want to ask one more relating to Jackie Robinson and seen here with him, Branch Rickey. And the general consensus that I've gotten talking to people, reading about the subject, is that Ricky made this decision to sign Robinson, trying to reintegrate the game, really two reasons. Number one, he did feel morally it was the right thing to do. Uh, he did not morally agree with the color ban, color barrier. But also number two, he saw an opportunity to improve his team with top black athletes while other teams were not doing the same. Is that the general feeling that you got that it was kind of split between those two factors? Yeah, yeah, no, it's, it's I think that's, um, I think it's more, it's hard to judge, right? Whether it's more than one or the two. So it's, I think it's fair just to say both, right? Like he, he felt a certain way. Um, but again, when you say that, it's like, okay, well, what about the year before? What about in 44? What about in 43? What about when you were with the Cardinals, right? Why didn't you feel the same way? Because there's, as you know, there's, there was a ton of black talent in St. Louis when he's with the Cardinals, right? And there's a ton of talent locally before Jackie, right? But then you get to that second part and you're like, okay, yeah, there's untapped talent. Um, and eventually if it's not going to be you, it's going to be someone else, right? And so why not, why not you, right? And I think he understood in 45, and this is one of the things I talk about in the book, not necessarily from his point of view, but in 1945, it was clear that integration was coming, right? And it was going to happen in New York, probably not with the Yankees. It probably would have been the Giants before that, just because the way... Uh, the law worked with the FEPC law, the labor law was working. Um, the other newspaper I was talking about that I forgot at the beginning, the People's Voice uh, is Black Labor newspaper. You know, they showed up to spring training in, in um, it wasn't in Florida that year, but up, upstate New York for the for the Dodgers. Um, and, and you could get a sense that that it, it was going to happen. Um, and I think the time right after the end of the war was almost a month after World War II that the timing makes sense. But if it wasn't going to be him, it's clearly somebody else. So Robinson reintegrates baseball at the minor league level in 46, at the major league level in 47. Certainly it's a major step in the right direction, but doesn't mean that all is well, because we would see the integration with other teams very slow process, very gradual process. It would take from 1947 until the late 1950s for every one of the major league teams to integrate uh, the Tigers and the Red Sox being the last two to do so. But there were other problems as well. And we see this Jim Crow segregation that was pervading American society. That doesn't just go away. And here's a, it's a great photo, even though it's very grainy, but it shows a baseball player in the situation of the segregated water fountain. Uh, this photograph was sent to me courtesy of uh, Veda Pinson's son, Veda Pinson III. Veda Pinson uh, II, who played in the major leagues, was a terrific center field for the Reds, late 50s, early 60s. I don't have the exact date on this photo, but it's probably around 1960, 1961. It's at the Red Spring training site in Tampa. And even though he's one of the best players on the team, he still has to drink from a water fountain that says colored. I mean, that just speaks volumes. Well, yeah, I mean, right. I mean, especially too, like being from, uh, if I'm correct, being from Oakland, right? Just those guys, whether it's him, Flood, Robinson, who are also Frank Robinson, who were also on those early Cincinnati teams, to then to be thrown into the South, right? And all of a sudden, sometimes you're the lone guy in one of those, I mean, Pence in here is not a pros, right? But sometimes when you're in the minors, you're that lone guy, right? Trying to, there's, you know, trying to be Jackie Robinson, put you in the middle of North Carolina, right? Where, where every newspaper is not following you. So it's not as safe. And then, you know, your laundry is not being washed with the other team. You're not staying with your teammates, right? Um, you're, you're having to go stay at maybe a black lawyer's house or a doctor's house, or maybe there's a, a lady who's taking family uh, players in, ball players in, and maybe you're hoping to just to get a good meal. And even, I don't know if you saw that, that Reggie Jackson um, documentary on Prime that just came out really good when they started to talk about him having to be, what was he in Birmingham or whatever, and, and just, what they had to go through, right? Oh, game's over. I got to go to the other side of town. 
I gotta find food. I gotta find, you know, how to get to one place from one place to another. And that's just how a lot of these greats had to uh, make it. And, and it's one of those things that's often overshadowed, right? We talk about, we celebrate what happens on the field, but we forget everything they had to go through just to get there. It's a great point about the Birmingham franchise, uh, 1964. Uh, Birmingham is reinstated as a team. The Southern League is reinstated. But part of the deal was that the city of Birmingham finally had to integrate. They had had a checkers rule for many years, which said that blacks and whites could not play any sports together, not even checkers. They couldn't do it legally in the city. Um, that law essentially had to be overturned. Birmingham was able to get a second franchise or a franchise for the second time. That enabled the Southern League to return. So that's 64 minor league team for the Kansas City A's, the Birmingham Barons. That essentially integrates sports in the city of Birmingham. And then Reggie joins that team just a couple of years later. And there were still difficulties, you know, having to deal with the Jim Crow segregation uh, in the South. Lewis, I want to get your take on this one. One of the things that really grates at me, I mean, we all know this, this kind of thing is morally wrong. But from day one in baseball, they tell you it's a team game. You got to play together. Uh, you know, it's a 25-man roster or 26-man roster today. Everybody needs to contribute, need to work together. And you, know, you go to spring training, and right away, Black players have to go in one direction to use a water fountain or use a laundry white players go in another direction. What, I mean, the message that's sent to these guys totally contradicts the team concept. Right, and, and, and I think um, that, but that, you know, for them, I think if you'd ask the black player back then, they, they, would, they would be mad, but they also understood it because that's what happened in our lives, right? Like I, even if Pitts is from, you know, Oakland, right? Or court floods from Oakland, they experience racism on, on, on a daily basis. It might just, it's not the South, but they, mm -hmm. so I think they're, unfortunately, they, they're used to this kind of treatment. Now you wouldn't think you would get that as a professional ball player though, right? And, and if you're like, to me, if I was a player and I'm looking at my team still being in segregation, then I look at the Dodgers who have their own facility, so you don't have to go through that. I'd be like, well, you know, wait a minute, right? Um, and, and that's what's so, special about some of these players we talk about the civil rights movement in the 60s this is how you get integration at these spring training facilities because it's the players right it's those players stepping up and saying no we're not doing this anymore you know um like bill brunson right um saying like look if if you're gonna have us on these teams then we're gonna be as you say full teammates and that means we're staying together um and so do your thing, Major League Baseball, do your thing. You know, St. Louis Cardinals, Milwaukee Braves, Cincinnati Reds, put, you know, use the power of your position, your economic position in these cities to change the laws. Jim Crow segregation would persist in other ways after Jackie Robinson's arrival in the 1940s. Uh, many of the Southern minor leagues remained exclusively white at least until the major leagues started putting pressure on them to start integrating those rosters. Uh, but that continued for years. I mean, it wasn't an overnight change. Um, also, you have segregated seating at Southern minor league ballparks. We have this ticket that you see on the screen. It's in our collection at the Hall of Fame. It's circa 1954, Eastman, Georgia. They're a minor league affiliate of the Dodgers. And clearly, this is a colored ticket. So it sends a signal that it's the fans who are also being segregated. In 1954, that's seven years after Jackie Robinson integrated the game. So when you see a ticket like this, you must find that a pretty powerful image. You know, it's a very powerful image, right? So I, I researched this kind of stuff and I wrote about it. I think it's chapter, chapter four. But, you know, to see that ticket, right, to finally see what uh, I've never seen uh, a Jim Crow sporting ticket before. You read them in the press, right? There'll be seats available for colored fans or or there, if it's a black gay, right, there'll be seats available for white fans, right? But I've never seen a, a, a ticket like that. So that's a fascinating piece. But but one of the things when we talk about segregated seating, as it continues, 
the black fans, and this is why the Southern League started to struggle, because the black fans just stopped going. You know, they they literally boycotted. So one of the things I write, mm-hmm. one of the teams I write about is the, the New Orleans Pelicans. It was by um, the Louisiana Weekly. They, there's a black newspaper. They started a, a major boycott. And eventually that is why the Pelicans had to fold. And there's real numbers, them talking about it in real time. Like we are losing. It was part of the Pirates, I think, might have been the Yankees afterwards, but they're losing a lot of money. And part of what's happening is that these black fans say, you know what, we're not going to sit like this anymore, right? Even if you have a black player, we're still not going to go. And so these teams without that fan base start to slowly but surely crumble, right? So part of bringing them back together, making sure, like you talked about those Birmingham Barons, is you have to have the black fans in there. If you don't have black fans, then you don't have Southern sports. And the moment that black fans realize the power that they have to stay away, to make changes, that's a lot of times teams have to make those changes because of the economic power the fans put on them. Lewis, this Pelican story is fascinating to me, partly because I'd never heard of it prior to your the book coming out. About when did this happen? How long did the boycott persist? And ultimately, did it lead to the disbanding of the franchise? Yeah, so um, it's, I want to say 1955 is when it starts, and then it goes for almost four years until, until it disbands. Um, and each time you could you could see um, the main sports writer really telling people to stay away, and, and those who go, they, they get on their case. Um, and, and it's just a, it's a yearly thing, um, and, and they, they keep every, if you can look, now the Louisiana Weekly, and, and so if you're a member of like Sabre or something like that, or you just have your own subscription, it's finally on newspaper.com. Like when I was researching this book, it was not on newspaper.com. So I wound up having to get every, uh, from, I have every issue from 1955 to 1968 um, mm. sports section PDF. And I went through them and I read them. So, so I have all this on file on it. You know, I could always consult it, but it was, to me, it's so powerful. And then it sparked other minor movements. Um, from black fans you'll see it at football teams uh football too so for example uh the raiders in 1963 the raiders and the jets were going to play um in mobile alabama a preseason game and they only have well there's only like four black raiders and a couple on the jets but they say you know what we're not playing mm-hmm. um if you're going to sit in segregated if you're going to have segregated seating here and it closes the game the jets and the oakland agree to not go there um, because they can't change the law there and so they just don't have the games in this situation was the ownership of the team hoping that new orleans would change its ordinance and and the city stubbornly refused was that what happened yeah and 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 so they're 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 they can't they're handcuffed and as much as they would have want to change because what happens is and this is great brings us back to jackie um New Orleans in, I want to say that it's in the book, <laughs> I want to say 1956, they, they changed their laws. They have, they, it's already a Jim Crow state, and then they double down on it to make sure that there's absolutely no integration in sports. Um, because what happens is the South, and I talk about this in the book, but the South looks at professional sports, spring training, these exhibition games as really a Trojan horse to integrated schools right so if you look at a lot of these things that are happening brown v board is 1954 and then that's when you have this kind of doubling down on these these sports laws these anti-integration sports laws um and so louisiana's um signs one and so you really can't do anything about it um if you're the the owners of, of the team and so the black fans are just like fine we'll, we'll stay away and we're gonna hurt you on we're gonna hurt you in the pocket, and and even like the Sugar Bowl, if if that's the one, if I, if I have that correct, that's the one uh, in New Orleans. They have an integrated Sugar Bowl. It's like one black player for Pitt in 1955, mm-hmm. and that's part of the reason why they say no more in 1956. But they're pleading. They're like, wait a minute, we need this. We need teams, and we need this fan base. Um, you know, because black fans would show up, and yeah. you're, you're starting to lose money. But one of the things that comes out of this, there's a um, editor in a New Orleans newspaper. And he actually blames Jackie Robinson. And he says, it's because someone like Jackie Robinson is speaking out so much about Jim Crow that we had to reenact these laws, right? Because he sees Jackie as the problem, right? Because he's, by 
I mean, mm. by that time, he's probably, it's fair to say, he's probably still the most popular Black person in America. Whereas, you know, King is on the rise, but Montgomery boycott just happened. And Jackie's still the guy. And this sports editor blamed Jackie Robinson. Now, Jackie being Jackie wrote back, uh, wrote a letter back to him, just kind of slammed him for everything he, yeah. he wrote. Um, but that's just the kind of fascinating part about Jackie. And, and there's, to me, the fascinating thing about this, too, is that there's so many of these stories. It's not just New Orleans, right? It's these other little cities that still, as more and more stuff gets digitized, can can be teased out. I'm trying to remember, Lewis, but didn't it take a while for New Orleans to get another team? Yeah, yeah. Now, I, I, I can't remember when they got a minor league team again, but it was it, – it, it, they were shut down. And, and that's one of the fascinating things about the Black press is that – Every now and then you'll pick up stuff about another team facing financial ruin because of uh, their Jim Crow policies. Also, speaking of some of these southern cities, and you write about them in the book, it's during the 1960s that Houston gets an expansion franchise and Atlanta gets a relocated franchise from Milwaukee. Those cities, I believe, also had to undergo some changes to their ordinances as well to clear the path. Yeah, yeah. And, and part of, I mean, part of Houston getting the team is actually they have to desegregate the city. And it's like local Black leaders and, and NAACP leaders are part of that contingent of, you know, Houston businessmen that go to Major League Baseball. And, and one of them's on the side really pushing Major League uh, Baseball because you can't have a Major League team in the South and then for someone like a Willie Mays or a Hank Aaron to go stay in a Jim Crow motel. It just wouldn't, just won't work. And, and, and so part of the power, I say this to a lot of people, the power of sports, these, these major franchises. And this is what's so sad that sometimes major league, you feel like they lost their way a little bit, but they could always make these shifts. They could make these changes, uh, put a lot of economic pressure on cities. And so it's like Houston, if you want to be this modern city, you're going to have to do this. Um, and so Houston gladly accepts. Now, um, this is important because they also have professional football there too. And we talk about black fan protests. The black fans in Houston would boycott um those teams there the 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 oilers there um because they still had jim crow city um and so when when you know these teams you would see it you the what the 61 60 and 61 season black fans would be out there uh boycotting and and if a black fan actually went to the game they'd be really upset at them Mm -hmm. um but that changes atlanta you know it's very vocal and public about wanting to be a modern city and understanding that sports is going to make it happen. So they eventually they have to clean up their act, right? And they want to clean up their act because they want to be a modern city because a modern city means that you're also, you're not getting shamed anymore for, for being a Jim Crow city, but you're also getting federal dollars, right? Coming into the city. And all of a sudden, if you look at it, they'll get the Braves and then they'll get the Falcons and then they'll get the Hawks from St. Louis. And these other Southern cities will start to follow. New Orleans, the same thing, to, to get the Saints, they have to promise their their mayor and the governor promises the NFL that there wouldn't be any more discrimination locally. I think the Braves are especially interesting because their star player, Black Hank Aaron, uh, they also had a Black Latino, Enrico Cardi. Uh, Dusty Baker is soon on the way after the move to Atlanta. So that's a fairly integrated team, and they're getting more and more integrated into the late 60s, early 70s. In the book, do you go into some of the experiences that these players had living and playing in Atlanta? Uh, no, I, I, I wish I, <laughs> I, I did. I wish I would have. You know, the book is just kind of like a quick hitter on a, on a lot of things. And we, I don't have time to really go into to what happens with the Braves. But one of the things I do know, and I, I wrote about it, I think, when uh, celebrating or commemorating commemorating um, MLK's life is just Hank Aaron and MLK, right? Trying to write from a sports perspective because Hank Aaron was worried. He did not, I mean, he's from the South, right? He didn't mm-hmm. want to go back to the South and play with Atlanta. And and part of what happens is these civil rights leaders like MLK and others had to talk to him like, hey, we, we need you for this one, right? Because you will be a visible representation of us and what we need. And one of the things Hank asked okay like what can i do right what can i do for the movement and he's just like be you right because that's all we need we just need your home runs your greatness and we're, we're going to take care of the rest but you are this visual representation of us right and it kind of helps them ease the way into moving to to atlanta 
We still have a few minutes remaining with our guest, uh, Lou Moore, a really fascinating conversation about uh, his book um, and about the struggles of black athletes uh, dealing with issues of Jim Crow segregation even after the integration of the game by Jackie Robinson in 1947. We do wanna take your questions and comments as well. And if you have a question for Lewis Moore, uh, you can post it right in the chat room. In fact, we have one from a good friend of ours, Ted Noor. Ted writes, uh, Lewis, could you comment on the 1968 Detroit Tigers and any part they played in quelling the violence that took place in the, uh, the 1968 insurrection and the race riots in the streets, uh, in particular, the involvement of Willie Horton? Was that something that you got into at all, Lewis? Yeah, I, I've written about it at, at another space. Um, I forget where, another online publication. Um, but yeah, that, to me, it's fascinating because uh, Horton is, Horton's local, right? Like Horton, and, and part of, we talk about the, the local Black community, one of the things, they were always on the Tigers uh, for being slow to integrate, but then also being slow to 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 integrate their local black talent. There's a lot of local black talent that got away uh, from the Tigers because they, they didn't want to integrate. And then when Hilly, Willie Horton comes, he's this huge local star, this high school kid who made it. And then, you know, those Tigers teams, I mean, it's not just Horton, it's, it's it was the Gates Brown and then they have, mm -hmm. uh, was or is it Earl Wilson, the pitcher, yep. right? And so they're, mm -hmm. they're well represented by, by really well-known black players. Um, and when the when the riots hit in 1967, it's devastation, right? It's it's um, and and Horton, as as I'm sure the the questioner knows, that he goes out and and gets out in his car and tries to calm the riots down. And, yeah, we're we're done. You know, there's there's no calming this because these fans, the the black community, is so upset about continuation of police brutality and, and lack of housing options and lack of economic opportunities that at that moment they didn't want to hear it from Willie Horton right this this baseball player who who had, who had made it uh, but that next year and, and HBO has a really good documentary on this it's actually on YouTube um, you get the sense that the team does help bring the city together because it distracts them right part of the Tigers playing trying to play as early as they did after the riots right i believe they're in, i want to say they're in baltimore right after that or they might be in new york one of those east coast teams is because they want to distract people put the tigers game on tv maybe people will be distracted from from the rioting so when you get to 68 that's the same thing that's going on right this hope that the success of this team will distract people from all this this kind of bad stuff that's going on right and and they win the championship and one of the things we do in sports is what that we tend to i'm not i don't want to be over critical here but we do tend to celebrate these moments and then we forget that nothing really ever changed in detroit for the longest time right that that the same problems of policing the same problems that of housing dis, uh, discrimination and economic disparity continued on but the tigers won a championship but it is it's it's a really good story though like you can't can't go wrong telling that story but it's also clear that things still continue to happen in that community that, that really make people upset. Have you ever met Willie Horton? I have not. I wish I, I, I wish uh, I could meet all these guys and just sit down and talk and get their stories. But no, I have not. We had him as a guest uh, Hall of Fame weekend a few years ago. I believe it was the year Alan Trammell was inducted. Okay. And the Tigers sent a lot of representatives. Willie was part of the traveling party. And we asked him to do a program in the bullpen theater. Uh, he did it absolutely free of charge and he was wonderful. I mean, he just, the, the character of the man, uh, the stories that he had, um, his incredible memory of going out into the riots in his full uniform, climbing on top of a truck and speaking into a megaphone. Uh, I mean, he put himself in danger and it, it tells you something about it. Yeah, no, he really, he really cared. And and I think he, he thought he could do something. But like I said, at just that time, it just, I think it, by that time, it was too late, right? There was no really um, saving the city. And, and for some people, maybe that's what they needed, right? Because, because, you know, one thing that you hear from someone like Martin Luther King is the riots are, are the language of the unheard, right? And, yeah. and at that time, um, there was nothing he could do. Ted Noor wanted me to pass this along to you. Sabre has its Negro Leagues Conference, the Jerry Malloy Negro Leagues Conference coming up in Detroit 
July 20th to 23rd. So he wanted to invite you to that. I'm not sure how far you are from Detroit, um, but he even said he'd pay for your registration. <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Not this year, because we're actually going, we have a big family trip going camping at that time. Uh, but I've been meaning to get to the Sabre Jerry Malloy conference. I've, I, I will be at Sabre next week at their baseball conference and we'll be doing a panel uh, with some other professors on uh, Black Ball in Chicago. Oh, nice. How far are you from Detroit? That's about two hours from Detroit. So pretty easy okay. drive. Well, I think uh, I think Ted will keep that invitation open for next year. So I'm going to hold him to it. If he tries to charge you, let me know. I will. <laughs> Uh, let's see. We've got another question from a fan named Andrew. Uh, hi, Bruce. Great show. Thank you. I'd love to hear from Lewis what he's seen these days uh, that are receptive of history. What trends he's seeing now that resonate towards justice for the Black athlete, or maybe that don't resonate towards justice? In in uh, in baseball, like can you read that again? Because I I got I got so excited that Andrew, I believe it was Andrew B, is asking the question. And let me tell you, uh, listeners, that he is one of the great local baseball players in in the Grand Rapids area. Very very Gary Pettis like speed out on the on the base pass. Okay, but what did, so what did he ask? What he said. I'd love to hear from Lewis what he is seeing these days uh, that are receptive of history. What trends are you seeing now that either resonate toward justice for the black athlete or do not? Wow, that's that's a tough question. Um, it's it's hard to say because just the way things the protests happen are different, right? It's more like on a t-shirt. But I'll say someone like if we're doing baseball, someone like a Mookie Betts. Was it last last year's All Star game or maybe two years All Star game has this shirt about black baseball, right? Where these guys are now starting to to raise awareness about um, the lack of black players in the game. And I think that's, that connects to like, we talked about the getting beginning, you know, someone like Jackie Robinson talking about the lack of black managers. Right. And, and I think one thing, there's just a clear thread from the beginning when you get Jackie reintegrated to today where black players really care about, about the game, about protecting the game and making sure other black players come along. Um, so I think that that would be something related uh, another thing is just the way economically people are using their position of power to make changes. Um, in the late 60s, you hear a lot of talk about uh, from these athletes about green power, um, about investing their money in these communities. And, and so if we get away from baseball, someone like LeBron James is certainly kind of uh, doing the same thing. But when it comes to like boycotts, you don't really have a lot of boycotts right you don't have a lot of uh players stepping away whereas these guys some like a, like i mentioned before like a bill brunson it's one of the reasons why you have integration in in spring training because these guys are part of the movement they're part of the civil rights movement and they actually want to bring it into baseball right um and and challenge the ownership to do better to use their power we mentioned earlier your book runs from 1945 to 1968 45, the reason's obvious. Jackie Robinson signs his first contract with the Brooklyn Dodgers franchise. Why do you use 68 as the end point? So uh, 1968 Olympics, John Carlos and Tommy Smith. And I think it just gives you, so that's October 16th. And I think it just gives you a good like end point, right? Here's Jackie Robinson. Here's like this, this new uh, black power movement, uh, you know, in athletics, the revolt of the black athlete. And so you go from integration to these athletes, you know, using their power to step away um, in sports to try to make change in society. And so it's just a good way, I think, to, to kind of wrap everything up. And, and Jackie, one of the things I try to do throughout the book is as much as possible, weave Jackie's story throughout there. Um, I don't think there's a I don't think there's a chat. There might be one chapter where he doesn't show up and that's, you know, it's intentional trying to put him in everywhere I can. Yeah. I'm trying to remember, but you mentioned the 68 Olympics were in October. Yeah. Was the world series still going on or was it done? by then? Yeah. So you get, if you go through newspapers, you get double coverage, right? So wow. if you're going to a Detroit paper or a St. Louis paper, there's, there's a lot of like, okay. Um, so it's right. It's right. I think it goes, it, it might've ended and then boom, here it goes. It's, if, yeah. if it's not crossing over, it's boom, boom. And so I look at the one hand, you get, you get the, the guy who does the national anthem in Detroit and then, 
it's got to be a couple weeks later, maybe even less than a couple weeks later, you have John Carlos and Tommy Smith raising their hand, uh, fist at the anthem, right? So you have that guy, forget his name. What is, I think, what does he do? Play rock and roll? At the, for the it was Jose anthem. Feliciano. And yeah, and people just lose yeah. their mind, right? Yeah. Um, and you go from that to now you have to deal with John Carlos and Tommy Smith, right? And one of the things, I guess, while we're on this, one of the, one of the more fascinating primary sources are political cartoons I found is one of these uh, St. Louis Black of uh, St. Louis Black newspaper where they actually um, mock uh, Tiger fans, right? Because Bob Gibson dominates them. And there's this cartoon that suggests that all of a sudden, uh, you know, this guy's mad that Bob Gibson dominated him and he's going to vote for George Wallace um, in the, in the next election. Uh, just one of those fascinating hmm. things where you got baseball and also political history coming together. I guess somewhat fitting too, you look at some of the participants in that 68 World Series uh, for the Tigers, we had Willie Horton, whom we talked about, Gates Brown was a great bench player uh, throughout the 1968 season. Um, they also had some other guys coming off the bench too. And then the Cardinals had great black players, uh, Gibson, you talked about him, uh, Kurt Flood uh, was on that team, you had a Latin American second baseman and uh, Julian Javier, of course, the great Lou Brock as well. Right. So uh, some really iconic black players taking part in that series. Yeah, no, it, I mean, St. Louis was full of black superstars. And I think Bill, I'm not sure if Bill White was still on a team or he's on his way out, but just he's traditionally in the 60s. He's a, yeah, and, yeah. And so those are, and they're, they're powerhouse players, right? And speaking about Kurt Flood, and we're in a and we're doing a Hall of Fame. I do have my Kurt Flood Hall of Fame shirt. So, <laughs> okay. uh, if there's two players that the Hall of Fame, I'm gonna say this now, needs in Kurt Flood and also the greatest player of all time, Eric Davis. Uh, so, so there we go. But yeah, those those uh, Cardinals teams just iconic with that star power, like Bob Gibson, Lou Brock, Kurt Flood. That that's a lot of star, a lot of black star power on that team. Yeah, I've heard that Eric Davis is your favorite player. Okay. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Kurt Flood is an interesting case. Now, if you look just at his career, he was not a Hall of Fame caliber player. He, uh, he was a great defensive outfielder, pretty good hitter, um, but didn't age real well. And of course, you know, when he sat out after the trade, his career kind of frittered away after that. Um, but you could make an argument, and some have made an argument, that if we're looking for a baseball pioneer to fit into right. that category, that maybe somebody like Kurt Flood would be a, a legitimate candidate along those lines uh, in that category. In our remaining moments, Lewis, I want to get your thoughts on a few other things that aren't necessarily directly related to your book, but they're still, I think, interesting topics. Here we have 2020. Major League Baseball announces that it's going to regard the Negro Leagues as equivalent to the established National American Leagues. So the statistics in Negro Leagues Baseball from 1920 to 1948 would now be incorporated into the Major League statistics that we find in places like BaseballReference.com. And the initiative had a slogan, the Negro Leagues are Major Leagues. Uh, a lot of people have applauded this, saying that this was a good thing. Others, though, have criticized, saying that, yeah, it was a good first step, but there hasn't been a follow-up. What are your thoughts? But three years later, right? So, so you know, I think it's you know, like you said, it's a great thing because people do need to learn about the game. And it's uh, when I was researching the uh, great courses, and it's, it's a twelve lecture series, by the way, and, and each lecture is about thirty minutes. So there's a lot of stuff I had to research. Um, but there's so many fascinating stories that we we miss because of, of Jim Crow and segregation. Um, and so just to give these guys their dues and just to say, acknowledge, you know, for the first time that several of these leagues were really good um, mm -hmm. and, and perhaps could have been better. And they could have been better, right? If they had the same economic standing as the major leagues. Um, but but you're right. Like, I think that, that you know, so stats are really hard to get to gather. Uh, so that's going to take some time. But then what's what is next? Um you know what you see with that that MLB game the show is great I think having uh jersey games where you know the the Tigers are wearing the Detroit Stars and the 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 Royals are wearing the Monarchs is great but I but I really think that and I know baseball is getting in the right direction but dealing with that lack of African-American players in the game it's starting to grow um again but it's very slow but I think it's you know a full court press I know it's baseball, but a full court press on that issue. 
um, starting at those lower levels and really starting at cost of the game, right? And, and, and cost really, mm -hmm. to me, as someone who's a parent, cost in all of you sports is just out of control. So if Major League Baseball, right? We talked about Major League Baseball being a leader in so many things, talk about integration and Jim Crow. If Major League Baseball could actually be a leader in getting the price of youth sports down, right? Where yeah. all these other leagues want to follow. I think that would be a great, and, and you can do it in the name of Negro League Ball, but, but you know, make sure that, that other leagues follow this example. I think that would be huge. The one thing on this initiative that I would have liked to have seen done differently, I wish they didn't cut it off in 1948 because there were still a lot of quality players in the Negro Leagues. There were still some really good teams in 49 and 50. Yeah, in the early 50s, it does start to tail off, but you still have players like Mays and Aaron and Banks. And I'd like to see those stats right. represented as well. Right. Like guys, like if I'm right, Artie Wilson, right? I don't know when he goes. He might have gone after 48, though, too. But but there are a lot of these guys. And and one thing, you know, Larry Lesser has this really good book on the, uh, the All Star games that continue past 48. But there, there's still stars there, right? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and and so those those guys need to be recognized. But you're right; it does it does tail off. Um, it does, you know, once you get into the late fifties and early nineteen sixties, it, it tails off a bit. But still, um, it does seem like forty eight is such a, a it, it's a very interesting date um, yeah. to to stop it at. Final question for our guest, Lewis Moore: When people read your book, if they're to take one thing away from it, that's really important above everything else what would you like that one thing to be mm. i think sports are, are so powerful um they're not perfect but they're powerful and 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 if done right they can make real change in our society well said uh the book is we will win the day the civil rights movement the black athlete and the quest for equality uh, it's a terrific book it's gotten rave reviews at just about every site that i've seen and if you'd like to purchase a copy of the book, these are some of the outlets you can get it from. Uh, of course, Amazon.com, that's the old standby, uh, but also from the publisher, uh, www.kentuckypress.com, or you can uh, visit the professor's website, proflumore.com. I like the name of that. Do your, do your students call you a professor? Ah, uh, man, these students, these days, you're lucky if they call you that. Uh, <laughs> Usually they just shorten it up to prof, right? They just, wow. yeah, yeah. It's a new generation. It is, it is. Lewis Moore has been our guest. Uh, the book, uh, We Will Win the Day. Uh, really appreciate your time. It's been a fascinating conversation. We've obviously here at the Hall of Fame been looking at this subject for our Black Baseball Initiative, but I've learned a great deal just listening to you this past hour. Uh, really, really thank you for giving us the time and giving us the book as well. I uh, appreciate you having me. Thank you. Lewis Moore has been our guest over this uh, past hour talking about the subject of Jim Crow segregation, uh, the efforts of Jackie Robinson, uh, the difficulties faced by many of the black athletes in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Again, uh, the book, We Will Win the Day. We wanna thank Lewis for being with us. Wanna thank all of our listeners and viewers as well. Hope you've enjoyed the program. Have a great day, everyone. Take care.